speaker is Dr. Anand and Sharma from ISR through Anandpuram. Uh, Dr. Sharma was elected as associate of the academy in 2023. And he will speak on laser communication through turbulent and turbid atmosphere. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks to the academy for giving me this opportunity to speak in front of this audience. So I'll be speaking on the topic laser communication through turbulent and turbid atmosphere. So I'm associated with ISAR Tiruvanthapuram in the School of Earth, Environment and Sustainability Sciences. So the work that I'll be showing here involves a lot of atmospheric science research and then connected to some communication and optics. So to introduce you to the subject, light as a form of communication has been in existence since a long time in the older civilizations itself they have been using fire and smoke or fire uh, torches to convey information from one place to another and even in the first half of the century when Alexander Graham Bell came up with the idea of photophone light was a mode of communication but it was not until the invention of lasers that light as a mode of communication took center stage so as of now there is this technology which is called free space optical communication or FSO in short which is an emerging technology where light is used as a communication uh, medium, communication mode and atmosphere acts as the channel. So it's very simple. It's just like pointing a laser beam from here to there. And in between whatever atmosphere is present acts uh, or regulates the performance of this communication system. So like any system, uh, any communication system, it involves a transmitter in which in this case it would be a laser beam. A receiver is there which is a photo detector and the channel here is the atmosphere. So whatever properties or characteristics are there of the atmosphere would be influencing the performance of the system. What uh, are the advantages of the system? It is wireless. There is no need to lay uh, optical fibers or uh, copper cables all the way around. It uses laser source. All the inherent uh, advantages of laser would be reflected on this as well. As of now, we don't have to uh, pay anything to get the system done as of now and it's very easy to set up and it is portable as I've shown here and it brings in with a lot of uh, advantages in the form of high bandwidth and data rates as well but like two sides of a coin with all these advantages told there are a set of disadvantages or demerits as well so what are they the first one is atmospheric scattering and absorption there are gas molecules and particles in the atmosphere which can scatter and absorb uh, light. So this would reduce or regulate the intensity of laser beam reaching the photo detector. So this can influence the performance of the system. This needs line of sight. So we can't go beyond something like 10 kilometers or 20 kilometers as of now because of the inherent curvature of the earth surface and then there are buildings or trees or all those which could act as hindrance to this. The most important aspect here which I would be highlighting in this talk is refractive index fluctuations. So we expect this light beam to fall directly onto some uh, surface but due to turbulence in the atmosphere the refractive index of the medium would change. So this can influence the system. So I will be showing how it is done and the atmospheric scattering and absorption can be seen here. So this is the image of the same location taken at two different environment conditions. One with clear sky, whereas there is not much pollution or particles in the atmosphere. And the same condition, but with polluted sky, there is a lot of fog or particles present. So you can see directly here, the visibility is largely affected by this polluted sky or the particle scattering and absorption. So the distance up to which the laser beam can propagate will be largely inhibited when you have particles in the atmosphere or which I refer to here by the turbid medium. And the second part, the refractive index fluctuations is shown with the help of a demonstration here. It is a video which was captured in our laboratory. So the dotted white circle that you are seeing here is the expected position of the laser beam. So under normal circumstances, we expect the laser beam cross section to be entirely within this dotted white circle. But then we did something. We brought in some uh, noise into the system. We brought in some flames and wind and all those things which introduce some refractive index fluctuations artificially in the system. So what happens now is instead of it falling into this dotted white circle, it is seen to dance around this white circle. So imagine this dotted white circle as a photo detector and you want this laser beam to fall entirely within this. Right? So this has happened within a few meters length span. Imagine this in the real atmosphere and the turbulence is too high. It may also lead to a situation in which the entire laser beam falls out of the detector. 
what would happen then? You get nothing. There is no signal resulting at the receiver end. So you don't get any signal at all if the atmosphere is really turbulent. So this brings us to the another term in the title, laser communication through turbulent medium. So these two aspects are being inspected in this talk. And the phenomenon what is shown here is called beam wander, which is a classic example of what atmospheric turbulence can do to laser propagation. And this naturally leads us to a question. Inhomogeneity in any medium can be a problem in optical wireless communication. So what could be the possible sources of inhomogeneity? One is turbulence which you can't do anything, it is always there. And the other sources of inhomogeneity have to be inspected. And this leads us to something else uh, which acts as a source of uh, heterogeneity in the atmosphere which is called atmospheric aerosols which are tiny solid or liquid particles suspended in the air. So there would be gas molecules and aerosols present in the atmosphere. Gas molecules are well mixed in the atmosphere, which means there is not much variation in its concentration or properties when you are measuring it from one place or the other. But these particles aerosols are not like that. They exhibit a lot of heterogeneities in space, time and along the vertical axis as well. So if they can influence any variations in refractive index fluctuations, that can have a lot of impact on laser propagation as well. And from the climate change perspective, they hold some significance because these particles can scatter radiation and lead to cooling of the earth's atmosphere. It can also act in the other way. Some of these particles can absorb solar radiation and heat up the atmosphere. So aerosol particles based on its chemical properties can be tagged with heating or cooling the earth's atmosphere. If any change happens in atmospheric temperature, it can directly affect the earth's refractive index as well. So this led us to studying these particles in detail. And what are the sources for these particles? This can come from sea sprays, volcanic eruptions, dust storms, and it can also be anthropogenic from fossil fuel burning, like the carbonaceous particles or what we call as soot. So this brings us a connect between climate change and communication. So the second aspect that I'll be highlighting here is how to quantify turbulence in the atmosphere. So I'll be going with a parameter called structure parameter for the refractive index, which tells in a very simple way, what is the difference between refractive index between two points or two time instances. So throughout this talk, I'll be referring to this parameter CN square to mention the strength of turbulence. If CN square is high, it means turbulence is high. If it is less, the turbulence is less. So uh, similar to aerosols, this CN square can also be time, altitude or regional dependency, it can also be there. And these both lead us to something unique or important. The existing models of this refractive index structure parameter, which we see in literature, have all been developed by making use of measurements from higher latitudes, US or Europe or so. So this, if we are applying it over our environment, will not be able to capture the turbulent effects faithfully. So this is because of the large variations in solar irradiance or the presence of clouds or aerosols and so and due to many other reasons. This calls for more observations in Indian region. We need more observational data. Only then we can say whether the characteristics shown by CN square is following some pattern or not. Or in other way, to develop a model for CN square, we need more observational data. This forms the primary motive for my research and the lab that I'm having. And if observational data is required, what type of observational data is required? You need observational data which would cover or satisfy laser propagation along horizontal line, which is like a city to city communication or along the vertical direction, which is something like satellite to earth communication. So you need measurements which would answer both these questions. This can be done by making use of near surface observations. We make use of sensors installed at the surface carrying round the clock of observ observations. You also have to make use of balloon or LIDAR observations to get the vertical characteristics as well. And these observations should uh, measure both aerosols and turbulence. So that forms the primary research motive from our group. These are all set of measurements that are being carried out from our lab or as part of collaborations that we are having. We make use of surface measurements. In Isotrimandrum, we have set up a lab which measures atmospheric aerosols around the clock and which would give us some optical and physical properties. And then we have some tower mounted sensors. Uh, this is part of a good collaboration between IIC and in ICER also we are having soon going to have this facility which is an edigo variance tower. 
This gives us a measure of atmospheric turbulence and meteorology which is essential in studying CN square and then automatic weather stations and then regular field campaigns are required and also to get the vertical characteristics we carry out to the tethered balloon or high altitude balloon flights and finally how to make use of a synergy of these measurements to finally reach to the main problem what happens to laser propagation through the atmosphere. This will be the long standing problem and the immediate research ongoing on, on this. Can you come to the results part? Because sure. Already taken yeah, sure. So, these are the results. So, this is an example of uh, a balloon campaign that was carried out. So, we have our sensors loaded on here which is our payload and this gives us a nature of how the vertical characteristics of CN square and aerosols are measured. This was carried out in the summer of 2024 and the first question to address was how could aerosols affect refractive index fluctuations. So, this metric delta C n square would be used. All those data that we have been using will be fed into a radiative transfer model to see what is the change in temperature that is imparted by atmospheric aerosols. So, this leads us to some results like this. This is the vertical profile of how much temperature fluctuations can be introduced by aerosol absorption. So, these are for different seasons. For the sake of explanation, I will be looking into this particular profile, the red one which corresponds to summer time, you can see some unique peaks in this profile and on the right side what you are seeing is how much fluctuations in refractive index is brought about by atmospheric aerosols. This is part of a sensitivity study and what can be observed here is as you move from the residence, uh, a parameter that is shown here is how much time these aerosols can reside in the atmosphere which we call as residence time or lifetime. As the residence time of aerosols increases, the refractive index fluctuations are also seen to be increasing and is it significant? It is significant enough to impart a change in refractive index fluctuations from a weak turbulence regime to moderate turbulence regime. So, this means aerosols can impart changes in atmospheric refractive index fluctuations and that is not something trivial. It can even lead to change in some uh, turbulence regime. So, this answered our first question, aerosols can introduce changes in optical turbulence. So, we looked into some another aspect where highly absorbing aerosols or what we call as suit particles were considered. A balloon flight gave us profile of atmospheric black carbon which is highly absorbing in nature and which should more clearly show some signals for atmos atmospheric aerosol effects. And the black curve is black carbon measurements and the red curve shown here is the profile for refractive index structure parameter. And what you can see here is at an altitude about 4.5 to 5 kilometer, there is a large layer of BC, black carbon present. And more interestingly, at those same altitude itself, there is a large dip in this refractive index structure parameter. And it is about 4 or 5 orders of magnitude reduction. What happens here is, these BC aerosols absorb solar radiation, heat up the atmosphere and this in a way reduces the temperature difference between the surface and that high altitude which reduces the thermal mixing happening in the atmosphere. So, it increases the stability around these layers. Due to this, it happens to be like this altitude where this elevated layers of BC is present, there is a large reduction in optical turbulence which makes it conducive for laser propagation to be more efficient. So, what could be the application for this? Suppose you want to implement such a communication link between maybe Bangalore and Mysore. It is not possible to do it in a single stretch because of the inherent uh, curvature of the earth and buildings and trees and all those things. An interesting approach followed is shoot a beam from Bangalore to some high altitude platform, drone or balloon or UAV or something like that. Take it from here to another UAV or drone, shoot it back to Mysore. Two questions exist there what should be the height at which this high altitude platform should be floated and how do you know what altitude is that. These results give some possible explanation or solution to that. Shoot a laser beam and do some laser remote sensing study, understand the vertical characteristics or profile of black carbon aerosols. If this uh, result holds true in all conditions, then the layer where black carbon is seen in large concentration could also be a layer where refractive index fluctuations are less. 
So if you want to implement such a communication system, flaunt your drones or UAVs in those altitudes. This reduces the power of laser beam required to implement the system which cuts down the cost a lot. So the main takeaway points from this talk is aerosols can introduce atmospheric optical turbulence and that depends on a lot of characteristics of aerosols such as single scattering albedo concentration and vertical distribution and optical turbulence models for Indian conditions we need to develop them because the models that are existing now are not faithfully capturing the measurements that are obtained from this region and this is a result of such a model developed from our lab so this is a reference CN square and this is our predicted CN square it doesn't account for aerosol effects but still we were able to capture the effects to a large extent thanks to some improved physics incorporated into the model I'm not getting into detail into the models in this but the takeaway message is we need to come up with models which would also account for aerosol effects as well because as of now all the existing optical turbulence models considers a condition called clear air turbulence or CAT where no pollutants clouds nothing is present but in this case we have seen that aerosols do impart changes in refractive index fluctuations so it is quite essential for us to come up with models accounting for aerosol effects as well and this could have a large a lot of applications it could be spanning from satellite to earth communication or laser remote sensing optical astronomy or directed energy systems and obviously this calls for interdisciplinary research making use of lot of atmospheric observations of aerosols or atmospheric boundary layer and then it also called for optics or communication groups to come up and do this research as well so with this i'll conclude my talk here so i would like to thank the funders and my collaborators here and the host institute our founder director is also here for giving uh, a lot of support to carry out these measurements and campaigns thank you so much thank you, any, any questions thank you Thank you for the interesting talk. I, I have a question because aerosol is a generic term. You have a lot of chemicals in that and it can vary, you know, like uh, sometimes hydrocarbon, sometimes freon. So is there, is there any specific chemical interaction is one part of my question. And listen, second part also, uh, you have this laser communication based on the laser wavelength. Is there any, part, uh, any part, particle size distribution which is crippling your communication effect? Okay. For example, uh, 10 micron particles, 3-4 kilometers up you mentioned about it. So these two questions you can address. Now, ah. So uh, sir, for the first question, it the effect of aerosol or whether what, what aerosol is can influence this depends on three parameters of aerosols. It's concentration, vertical distribution and so and more than that single scattering albedo which tells how much scattering to total scattering plus absorption is contributed by this aerosols. So if it is something like a soup particle, it will absorb a lot. So they can uh, bring some variations in atmospheric temperature but compared to that some aerosols like sulphate or sea salt they won't contribute anything to atmospheric temperature change as such because they don't absorb anything. So we need to come up with some accurate models or measures for single scattering albedo to give a quantification for whether all aerosols or some aerosols would be imparting that change. And the second part about the wavelength aspect the aerosol effects would be large if the wavelength and the particle size are matching and uh, in the uh, in perspective of scattering because uh, based on my theory if uh, size of the particle and the wavelength are similar then interactions would be higher if that's the case something like 500 nanometer or 600 nanometer would be the ideal wavelength where all these aerosol effects based on scattering would be present but there are also some wavelengths where absorption would be higher so that would be higher for lower wavelengths something like 300 nanometer or 400 nanometer there the absorption effects would be larger but if you are going with that, then the total atmospheric attenuation may also come into picture. The particle size can change, you know, the dynamics. Yes, yes, that would be a continuum. Yeah, due to rain or many other parameters. Yes, yes. Do you take care of that? No, as of now, it is not taking care of those dynamic changes. Just a very outsider sort of question. When you are trying to transmit information using laser, you are presumably going to change the laser intensity. That's where the information is encoded and now this laser is going through atmosphere and there will be fluctuations in the laser light. So what is the standard deviation in the fluctuations because of turbulence and you know you need a certain you know range of uh, change in intensity of the laser to transmit information. Will it drown out all the information that you are trying to send, the turbulence or the aerosol? Huh, so uh, the results that I have shown here are not based on actual laser propagation studies. These are all based on the initial atmospheric characterization done. 
So I guess uh, the question that you asked is if intensity is too much will it lead to some issues. So that may actually lead to something called as saturation regime. So where actually it, based on literature it is shown that there is not much increase in the influence of atmospheric tur uh, turbulence on propagation. So there is something called a weak to strong turbulence regime in between the effects would be predominant beyond some range that is not observed. So uh, I think I have to also carry out some observational studies to validate this. Are there some situations where uh, the uh, where, where this can actually help the communication? Hmm. Uh, can it sort of augment certain frequencies and certain kinds of aerosols can do that? Hmm. Huh. So this was actually shown as uh, advantage in communication system or uh, more importantly in aerial FSO communication because classically this soup particles are considered as a problem in communication because they can lead to more absorption or scattering. But if such suppression in optical turbulence is happening, it can overcome the deleterious effects brought about by absorption. So this can actually act as a boon in aerial communication. Yes. So uh, another naive contemplation. Uh, so this elevated black carbon layer, so that uh, height will change, right, with uh, day breaks and also seasonal variations. So that also has to be taken care of. Yes. So do you yes. have such data of variations of uh, no. changing this altitude? No, this is observed, uh, this is obtained from a previous balloon flight. Okay. Okay. We don't have data for dynamic changes with respect to that. Uh, okay. okay. Huh. And also, uh, there will be so much of uh, interference with light pollution, I would say, hmm. in terms of uh, differentiating between your signal and the noise hmm. uh, in the background, because hmm. there are other lights which are scattering from these particles. And uh, so, do you think those are also considerations for geographical locations where these kind of communications may be made use of? Or Maybe in the cities it will be much more difficult compared to uh, less, I mean, lower bottle uh, sky level areas. Uh, it will obviously be a problem if you have background noise uh, in between. But as far as a communication uh, engineer is concerned, that is not something which would be more troublesome as compared to this random fluctuations in uh, refractive index. So those effects can be overcome by engineering uh, design or something. but. These are out of hand and so it would be having an upper hand when you are doing this link budget analysis. Thank you. So I have one or two questions. So you mean the, if the atmosphere is more turbid, you have more turbulence in the atmosphere, especially when you have dirty particles like black soot. But uh, how far in the atmosphere these uh, carbon particles reach? I am sure they may not be reaching beyond, two, uh, beyond 4 kilometers or 5 kilometers as you see a major hmm. spike here. Hmm. But most of the uh, air traffic moves above that layer, say 10 kilometers or 11 kilometers. Mm. So I'm sure these are not going to affect the uh, the turbulence or the movement of the planes, the air traffic. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So what is what are the other factors that drive the turbulence in the atmosphere? Because many times we see the plane is just shaking up and down. Mm. Like recently we saw Singapore Airlines mm. lost height of uh, almost one or two kilometers and mm. one. Person died. So, what was the reason for that? So, there are two main sources for this, this turbulence. Is troposphere, is ah, layer this is troposphere only. Yeah. So, in this case, it would go to some so 15 kilometers. So planes move, you know, fly yes. above. Yes, yeah. yes. So, there are two sources for turbulence. Uh, one would be thermal driven, which is based on the temperature fluctuations uh, between the surface and the upper atmosphere. The other could be uh, due to the mechanical aspects, which is wind shear. What is the vertical gradient in wind shear? So the high altitude uh, turbulence experienced by aircraft is usually due to this wind shear fluctuations. And the other aspect that you asked uh, rightly that whether these particles can go to high altitudes, it can go, but not but very rarely because they are, these are quite heavy particles. Uh, not, like. not due to surface convection, but as you told the aircraft emission is a serious source for uh, such emissions in the higher, higher altitudes. Yeah, can it can be back there. To one or slide where you, yeah, it is this one. So I could see post monsoon uh, these aerosols here hmm. at lower altitudes are more. What is the reason normally the aerosols are washed out post monsoon? Huh. So uh, this is a classic case of atmospheric boundary layer dynamics. So in summer we have larger surface temperatures where the thermals could rise to very high altitudes. But this is the time when uh, the summer is no more. Right? Ha, no more. So during the winter or post monsoon the surface temperatures are less even though the surface concentration would be less. Whatever is there would be within some few kilometers or so. 
So even though the surface concentration is less, if you check the peaks here, it may be larger. But you won't have anything in the higher altitudes. Thank you. Uh, if there is no other question, so let us clap for both the speakers, Dr. Barwan and Dr. Sharma for their wonderful talk. Thank you.